but uh, he he hasn't had his proper allotment of coffee, so we'll we'll see how he is today. Uh, go ahead, Scott. Hey, how's it going, Langdon? Uh, I guess I'll introduce myself. My name is Scott McCarty. I am a product manager for um, container tooling and images, um, and so I drive the roadmap for like Red Hat Universal Base Image and Podman and Scopio and Builda and Cryo um, inside of OpenShift. And then I'll say this, like, so we went through this, this whole Kubernetes thing where everybody kind of got nervous. We went through this like two years ago. So like Red Hat in particular moved away from Docker, you know, to Cryo and Podman with the launch of RHEL 8 and with the launch of OpenShift 4. And so I published probably five articles about that around that time and allayed a lot of people's concerns at that point. And so, yeah, I have a lot of it. It's funny, we already have the experience that the rest of the world is now starting to go through it. I'm like, oh, welcome to my world. <laughs> yeah, Scott is the, uh, the I don't know, container runtime genius of Red Hat, right? Like, if you were I think called... Dan Walsh is the genius. I'm just the Well, you're, clown. yeah, true. That there's a, right. <laughs> The reporter, um, perhaps. So the, the, yeah, like if you remember a few months ago now, we had Scott on talking about all these different like run CC run kata containers and how to like, they all just kind of work, you know, it's just files on a file system that you tweak and off you go kind of deal. Um, this well, that's kind is of like, kind that's of kind of the of same thing, right? Like, yeah. I mean, this is the idea behind OCI, right? Is like there, there was an organization that developed a spec so yep. that we wouldn't, you know, have to worry about this kind of problem, right? Is that we can have kind of, competitive container run times uh, that will all run the same kinds of things. Um, and, uh, you know, and, it, and in a lot of ways, it's, it seems like it has been very successful. Um, and so that's kind of a little bit what we want to talk about. Um, you know, should we, uh, should we hit the slides or dive right in? I don't know. We, we need everyone to wake up a little bit and start asking uh, some questions. So I was wondering if we should uh, show our slides. Um, yeah, I mean, this is the level up hour. You kind of have a program, so let's do that. Yeah, I, yeah exactly. Um, now I have to find the slides, which is, oh, you, you know, lost them. Oh, always, a, yeah. always a challenge. Um, <laughs> and of course, because uh, it's been a few since we uh, last had the show, uh, nothing is going to be logged in. And I changed... I changed providers and all that jazz. Um, let's see, how about present? Oh, right, but we have the fun, uh, you can't present uh, in the same, win in a different window anymore. It's really annoying. Um, all right, let's yeah, see. I, the, no, the changes that have happened to our normal to lean over the break, <laughs> the break. is interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, let's see, I think I finally figured it out though. Uh, ch -ch -ch Let's try this button. music. There we go. Yes, yeah, exactly. Go. More Jeopardy music. Although, actually, and Alex Trebek's last episode was in the past couple of weeks as well. Yeah, um, which was very sad. Um, all right. So, as we said before, this is the level up hour. In case you are lost, um, and uh, theoretically, I'm sharing my screen. Uh, although sure. all my windows are now rearranged and confusing. Um, so uh, just about the show, uh, you know, we are your regular hosts. Uh, I'm Langdon and Chris is Chris Short, both on Twitter. That's kind of our primary kind of communication uh, for, for push mechanisms. Um, and then uh, if you want to have a chat about this show or basically about anything else, OpenShift TV or really anything in general, um, you can join us on our Discord. Uh, and uh, in fact, you can, you can use the Discord to participate in the chat for this uh, show and all the other shows uh, yeah. because it's all uh, thanks to Restream, Restreamed around um, to, uh, to all the different ways that this channel is broadcast. Mm -hmm. um, so let's see, uh, just by way of background, as we mentioned, this is Kubernetes and Docker deprecation. I'm thinking about changing the episode titling because uh, I'm still struggling with like, what does season mean, right? In, in a live streaming thing. So uh, instead I went with the uh, super clear and understandable uh, year, month, day format, because uh, then at least it will, uh, order automatically by, uh, you know, I with LS. Like yes. Yeah. yeah. So, so I'm, I'm toying with that. Um, and actually these are just the show notes from last time. I apparently, I forgot to update that piece of text, but the link is correct to the last episodes, uh, show notes. Um, so check those out if you like. And, uh, you know, we, we try to recap the whole show and talk about, um, 
you know, kind of what I try to do is I try to capture everything that happened as well as like capture like, hey, you want to learn more about this particular subject, go check out the further reading on this. I try to pull out some fun video highlights. I'm more successful than others, depending on how funny we were that particular episode. Um, so remember, more funny uh, is better. That way I can find video clips. Um, but that's it for the slides for the moment, because Otherwise, we would be giving away the sweet, sweet internet points, and we want to hold that till later. Yes. So, uh, do we have any questions so far? Is anybody, uh, we have a few people, it looks like. Uh, yes, we have a lot of people in chat, but um, Narendra is asking, when is the Get Us happy hour? It is next week, correct, uh, at 3 p.m. Eastern on Thursday. Nice. So, we were thinking about changing the time. I'm not sure if we're going to do that. That'll be discussed later today. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, cool. Yeah, so, stay tuned to the calendar, which I'll drop a link to in the chat right now. Well, thank you to everybody who is, you know, a regular on the show and has come back today. Um, we appreciate it. Um, so how do we want to kind of talk about this? Uh, Scott, should I look to you and kind of say, can you give us a little bit more detail on what this change means? Um, I know there's a bunch of good blog posts, uh, good articles out there, but I think it's also always useful to kind of explain it in voice um, and uh, and see, you know, and help, you know, maybe that'll engender some questions uh, about, you know, some of the details that maybe people are confused about. Yeah, I was thinking, I was thinking I could probably walk through the five main points I made about like what the five pieces, what does Kubernetes support even mean? And I kind of break it down into five things that we could probably right. like walk through each one, even though I wrote them in text, you know how it is verbally. Like once you start talking about something, you highlight things, you know, anecdotes and things that mm -hmm. you hadn't thought about and things you didn't capture. Sounds you know, great. Probably be useful. Yeah. So, uh, so why don't you go ahead and tell us, tell us what does it mean? Yeah, and I'll share. Do if I share a link, I guess what's the best way to share a link with everyone? Like, is uh, there... in the chat is actually the best. If you want to send it to me, I can push it to the chat or um, the the Zoom. Chat. Share it however you want, Scott. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll make sure it lands in the right place. How's that? Okay. <laughs> cool. I have shared it on the Zoom chat because I know we end up restreaming over other things, so I never know how this. You guys have the most sophisticated setup out of anyone I know. It's all about magic. It's all magic. about the magic. magic. All the magic. It is, yeah. It is technology used sufficiently such that it appears to be magic. Right. Right. Um, so, so like I wrote obviously an article on this, and then I was a little clickbaity. I'll fully admit, with like Kubernetes is removing Docker support. Kubernetes is not removing Docker support. <laughs> like, we didn't like, do that with this show at all. You know, no. with yeah, the title or anything. That. Yeah. No. Of I would never cop to that. Two thousand twenty twenty one. Um, <laughs> but you know, like I and I and it's funny because. I talked about all this like two years ago when we when we moved OpenShift to Cryo, and I was prepared that there would be a ton of questions. I mean, if you go back, we had started working on this even in OpenShift three seven. So really, it's more like three years ago. I don't know, three and a half, four ish years. I it was I can't remember the dates. Like if that's how long ago it's. It was probably 2016, 17. And actually, I just even filled in a history of all this. So we were already thinking about like once we saw the the once once. Obviously, OCI is one piece of this, and then CRI in general, like having the container runtime interface that Kubernetes right. end up building, right? Like, so, so you, you know, I started thinking about how could we talk about this, and like, how could we, how could we explain what the difference actually means to people in something that they care about, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, this this version that I published recently is basically the culmination of like three and a half years of thinking about about this. So I think it's a lot more crisp now. I can explain it, but you know, there's basically five different things when you say the word Docker. You know, like what does Docker support? There's like five different buckets of things you think through. The first one being like container images, right? Like, I mean, Dan Walsh talks about this all the time, and I still fundamentally believe like PaaS already existed. Um, you know, so we already had highly automated ways to deploy code. We had that, like, and for some reason that a lot of people can't get their brain around, we ended up going backwards, right? Like we went backwards to something that isn't quite as easy, but way more powerful. Um, and I feel like I have to keep reminding people of this, even though we've been doing it for like six years, there's a reason why containers took off. The container image is probably the fundamental reason, right? And so right. container images are still supported. Like, doesn't matter what container engine you're using, doesn't matter whether you have Docker, and if you're using Kubernetes with Docker or using Container D or using Cryo, you know, like that's that's supported no matter what, right? So like that's number one. 
Um, actually, let me highlight them all. So container images is, is the first thing, you know, um, the second thing is the registry server. The third time is the runtime format. And by that, I mean, like, what does my container look like when it's running in Linux or Windows? Um, and then the fourth thing is command line interface. And that's where it starts getting a little hairy. Um, and then the, the fifth one is application programming interface. And if I were to like star all of these, I'd say like, even not using, you know, you're getting like five stars still in container image format, five stars with registry server, five stars with runtime format. You're getting like four stars with command line interface and you're maybe getting like zero stars for like API. Like there is, that is truly probably the biggest change. Um, you know, is around that is around the API, like what APIs are available and whether you should have even been using those APIs anyway in the first place, but that's kind of beside that we can get into that deeper. Um, and so, yeah, yeah that, I, I was going to kind of comment on, on some of that, right? So one of the examples of, of kind of like, should you have been using those APIs, right? Is like um, Jerome, who I can never pronounce his last name, but it starts with a P, um, you know, has talked uh, several different occasions about things that you can do that are really, really cool. Like, can you do doing Docker inside Docker, for example? Right. Um, actually, yeah, you know, and awesome. Dan Walsh, I actually I remember specifically doing something along the same lines, particularly with contain uh, with sorry with System D inside Docker, and then Docker running in that, and then virtual machines. Like, these are all very cool things. Cool in production usually not something you should put together you know so like there are specific use cases where some of these things are like important and necessary or whatever but the vast majority of cases you probably are trying to build something a little crazy yeah i agree uh, and what happens is people i don't i don't know if we want it we could we don't have to tackle them in order but we could probably jump into apis because it's the hairiest one but but people yeah. usually end up in that scenario not on purpose they like right. They have some, they were like running a Kubernetes cluster, like Kubernetes 1.11 or something, right? And they were running it with like, you know, with Docker, because that was all that there was, you know, or whatever at the time. And then one day they go, oh, we need to scan our images. And they go, you know, security team came and beat us up, said we got to scan these images, but we got to do it in production. And you're like, how do we do that? And you Google search, and then you're like, oh, there's this tool that will talk to the Docker demon and we'll like scan the images, right? Like, and you're, you find it. And then you go, oh, you know what else we got to do? We need to do we need to like snapshot the image. Cause like we did this update and then Kubernetes broke and blah, blah, blah. And, like you end up down some rat hole, right? Like where you're like, Oh, we tried to do an update. It failed. So now we're using the snapshotting tool that talks to the Docker API to snapshot it before we do an update. And you're like, wait a minute, that's getting pretty wacky. Like you probably shouldn't do that. Like you should probably let Kubernetes handle that, but okay. I mean, deployments are probably a better way of doing that, but like that it was at the time it was the wild west and nobody really like actually even deployments didn't even, or maybe deployments existed, but, um, uh, actually, I don't think deployments even existed early on. So like, so like, those are yeah. the kinds of, they're like these time-based, you know, temporal, you know, it's always a race condition, right? Like you have a business problem or a technical problem and you're like, I got to solve this thing. And then you end up fixing it before it's fixed kind of the right way because you have the problem today, right? And so then what happens is I've seen it, you know, some of our customers, even with OpenShift 3, they end up in the scenario where they have two, three, four, five tools inside the Kubernetes cluster, like running on the nodes, talking to the Docker daemon. And that's probably the hairiest place. Like, like that's the hairiest mm -hmm. place where you're like, oh man, ripping out Docker does kind of suck in that scenario. Um, well, but for I everybody mean, else, like they won't even notice it, right? Like it should be like transparent. Well, I, and I was gonna say like, one of the things that you, you, you kind of need to remember about Docker. Well, so first of all, uh, you know, I have a little bit of a demo that we can walk through in a little bit, but like um, when you say Docker, <laughs> usually people are referring to the thing that launched, I don't know what, seven years ago or something now, um, that thing and what Docker, the company, which wasn't even called Docker, the company at the time right. um, are actually quite different. Right. Um, and, you know, so the thing that, is is necessary to remember is that when docker was originally developed it wasn't really meant to be this thing that would run in an automated kind of environment and you know specialized world you know in a sense it wasn't even really trying to replace like paths or something like that per se not in the automation side of it etc it yeah. was really a, a ux tool you know or a user experience tool for developers or administrators who worked for this particular company, um, you know, which now I can't even remember the name of. Dot um, Cloud. Dot Cloud, that's dot it. Cloud, yeah. um, 
that, you know, they were using this in their production environment to basically host other people's software. And then it just kind of took off by storm because of how awesome that user experience was. But what it didn't do a great job of was disconnecting the kind of client side tooling of it, you know, so what it like a developer uses or even an administrator uses and the production runtime. And what we're, and so what Kubernetes has been kind of fighting with is accessing that production aspect, right? Their production runtime part of it by way of the client UX runtime or whatever. Um, and that's what Docker Shim does, right? Is basically that hook. And so it's not that there's anything inherently wrong with the components underneath, but rather that it's uh, like how they're linked together and how you have to access them. And in a sense, that's actually why Docker has gone on to create ContainerD, for example, yeah. and pull that out. So you don't have to access the APIs in a non-public way. And I view it as a, it's an API battle, right? Like it was an API battle. Like Heroku probably came out with PaaS. For, Heroku is the first company I knew about that did PaaS, right? Like all my friends that were in Startup 3s in Heroku back in like, I don't know, 2008 or something. I don't remember. It was yeah. a long time ago, like 2011, yeah. 2008, that kind of time frame. Um, and you go, okay, so that API started to kind of win, right? Like there was like, oh, I can, I could just type these few commands or maybe wire it into my Ruby code and have like this deployment. They'd have these deployment scripts in Ruby that would just go out to Heroku and deploy the script, you know, deploy like an entire application, right? And so you're like, oh, instead of, and at the same time you had config management also competing, right? So that's another API for like configuring things and deploying things. And like, there's just this like wild west of deployment APIs is what I'd say. And then, you know, then, Again, it, something like Heroku and then even OpenShift like two was really highly automated. Like it was really good. It took like one command to deploy something. You yeah. one could argue it was actually every bit as easy as Docker or easier. Um, but what it was, it was Visual Basic. Like it was great as long as what you were doing was Visual Basic was good at it. And then as soon as you had to like do something that Visual Basic wasn't good at, you were like, oh dear God, I've now got to write like this C module and plug it in and like I mean it became very hairy, very fast, right? Like it was not, it was good until it wasn't. And that's what, in my view, that's what Paz was. It was amazing if all you wanted to do was deploy Ruby. But as soon as somebody said, oh, we have this, we have this uh, actor pattern model thing where the Ruby things have to go fire up other Ruby things. They're like, well, you can't do that with Paz. Like that's crazy. Um, or like anytime you'd end up in one of these edge cases, getting out of Paz became really pain in the ass. Then Docker came out, like you said, as like a management tool, right? Like, right. It was just like, a, hey, let's deploy things easy. And that API just like clearly won. Like, it was amazing. Like, you're yeah. like, okay, this is way easier than everything else. Then, well, well, I mean, combine bash with the, uh, you know, experience of containerization, right? And I mean, basically all a Docker file is, right, is, you know, a bash script written in a way yeah. that, you know, something It was kind of like Debs versus yeah. RPMs, to be honest. Like the Debs are yeah. just easier, let's be honest. Like RPMs are harder. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I know I'm a Red Hat guy, but that's a fair statement. Like it takes more work to get good at RPM and understand it. It is more powerful, but it also requires more investment. And the bottom line is people don't care about investment. They're like, I don't want to invest. I just want this to work, right? Like, right. so get, get the job off. Done. Like, yeah, building Heroku, you know, plugs or whatever slugs or whatever they were called at the time, or building Obichif two slugs, they were freaking hard. Like, that was a. T I yeah. got I got rebuffed by that like ten times. Like, I'd sit down and go to do it. I'd be like, ah, I don't know. I don't, I don't feel like doing this. Like, it was just hard. <laughs> right. Right. I, I did want to make a, a little shout out there with the Visual Basic comment, though, because back when I was doing Visual Basic, uh, Visual we Basic. would do uh, we would actually literally have strings of assembly uh, in our code that we would execute in RAM to rewrite V tables so that uh, we could get what we wanted to work. Oh, so you could you could do anything. In, oh, you could do it. If you try hard enough. Yeah. It, it was and then pretty. I'd say like the other problem is then the API battle went to, OK, Docker's really good at running a few services on a single node mm -hmm. and then we all saw that wait a minute at scale you need like like i don't know what dot cloud cloud had internally but i assume they were already they're like oh this makes a single node really easy but they probably had some extra software layer that went out and talked to the docker api and scheduling like if you're a hosting provider it's not the same as a cloud provider let's be honest like like the spin up right. shutdown is like five percent of your workload and the running is like 95 percent a cloud provider like 35 40 percent is your spin-up shutdown right like, like your your actual runtime capacity is probably lower and 
that's the problem with the configuring the networking, configuring the workload, C, you know, allocating CPUs, deallocating, blah, blah. It's the allocation, deallocation that ends up eating so bad. And so like Kubernetes was way better at that, right? Like, and so as soon as you went to do that at scale, you're like, oh, but of course, Docker didn't want to give up. And, and, and Docker was the thing that Kubernetes got built on. So that talking to Docker was hard coded. And then we went through that period. Where we were like, oh, let's break this out. Let's call it the Docker shim. That code was already part of Kubernetes. They basically mm -hmm. just severed it, created an API called CRI in between, and then said, we'll keep that code, the same code that we've had forever, because it's really simple. It just runs a few Docker commands, essentially. Um, and then and then here we are, like, whatever this is now, five years later, or whatever the hell. Well, it, I mean, later. also at the time, right? I mean, at the time, the standards weren't set either, right? No, um, right. You know, like, you we know, there wasn't CRI maybe and, yeah. maybe the first <laughs> earliest draft of CNI was happening, you know, or uh, sorry. Um, R. Yeah, no, CNI, right? Um, uh, you know, CRI is from time. CRI. Right, right. Container so that or image. the container image format, which which is I can I rant thinking. about the name oh. as well. Yeah, right. Yeah, uh, there's that. Yeah, there, there's too many C's and N's in all of them, and I get get them mixed up all the time. I need like a cheat sheet, you know, along with my VI cheat sheet. Um, so yeah, but so so I mean, it, you know, it's like every other uh, you know kind of nascent technology that we see, right? It goes through a lot of churn on uh, you know kind of how it works and how it connects together because you know particularly in the open source world um what wins is what works and you know the person that wins is the one who writes the code right so um you see like and then you know and even uh, you know i really uh give you know, this is where i give google a lot of credit right where um they really did push that kind of um release early and often and and you know it's beta gmail was in beta for what like 10 years or something yeah. um you know like there's there's both a downside to that in that you now have lowered expectations of end users about the quality of your software but there is an advantage of there is that you can innovate 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 you can keep playing with it you can keep working with it and i think what you're just seeing here is that evolution of yeah. those you but know, some people get pincered and that's right the people the people that had stuff that was talking to both the docker api and the kubernetes api in a big cluster do get pincered but that is a minority, right? Like that should be a very small minority. It it hit vendors, you know, like like ride along vendors. Like you know, there were vendors that would go and talk to the Docker API to scan images. There were vendors that would do, talk to the Docker API to do backups of data. Like there was all kinds of experimentation. And the problem was, is experimentation in a marketplace. Once I've bought it, I'm annoyed, right? Like like I'm going to be very annoyed if I have money and time, you know, labor and capital invested in this, and now. And now the, the carpet gets moved. And that's that's probably the biggest downside of the Docker deprecation. It's like the people that have that. But the good news is, and this is what I, this is why I don't mention this in the article. Like, like the good news is, is Red Hat already blazed this trail for you. So we went through a lot of this pain banging our head against those metal objects, you know, ahead of time. So that most like because OpenShift ha is probably the biggest, you know, Kubernetes distribution that is independent that people install themselves. Right. Like, um it already blazed the trail here in that like all the vendors that work with Kubernetes were like, I want to work with OpenShift. And when we moved to cryo, they went, Oh, we got to use the CRI interface. We can't just go directly to the Docker daemon. And so at a minimum, you know, there's hundreds of vendors that were either looking at they're at some stage of the pipeline of either looking at moving to CRI in process of moving to CRI or have moved to CRI. And so like data dog and anchor and like, you know, black duck. And like, I mean, I, I talked to probably like a hundred vendors, you know, in the last two years of like, how are they going to move from the Docker API to CRI, basically? And so the good news is that trail is getting blazed already, and it's mostly blazed. So, like, by the time it hits you, will be another year from now, like, you know, say, because um, it's deprecated. It's not gone, gone, um, you know. But Although, like, I, I will, I mean, you know, like I said, I think largely we're trying to kind of say, you know, we, we really hope for the vast majority of use cases this is not that big a deal. I was a little surprised to discover that the removal is actually sooner than I thought. It's actually the end of now this year. Yeah. Um, oh, is it? Yeah, that is. Yeah, really so, I uh, too. yeah, I thought it was going to be more like a two year thing, you know, um, but, you know, going back to that kind of, you know, innovation thing, uh, two aspects of that. Right. One is that, you know, it does churn a lot. So things do move fast. But on the flip side of that, um, one of the things we have learned over over the years uh, with highly, uh, you know, innovative things, whatever, is to actually have 
you know, for lack of a better term, LTS-ish, um, you know, uh, uh, versions, right? So, so there are versions of Kubernetes that are sticking around longer, right? Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, we're, we have an open shift out, for example, that's got a longer term of service than uh, traditional, right? So, so you can, you can probably delay that adoption without losing too much. Um, you know, one of the things that was, the big driver for something like rel for adoption right is that the hardware was changing so you you couldn't delay it if you if you went and bought new boxes right and they had new you know whatever you know uh sata drivers or something you had to go get the new rel like you didn't have any choice um because the just the straight up hardware is different so if <coughs> yeah, something the... like kubernetes or whatever like it, the delay is is less or like it's less uh forced to kind of move on, you know, obviously you want to maintain support your, you know, whoever's your vendor is providing support. But aside from that, there's not a big driver to move aside from being able to take advantage of features. Um, yeah. And features are often a good driver to remove, but at the same time, it's not because it won't work otherwise. Right. Um, so I think that's yeah, the secret of cheap hardware is, is that it changes fast. Yeah, so exactly. Like, exactly. <laughs> Intel, yeah. Intel, and ARM are always going to have the fact that they move fast, and so you get dragged along. You know, back in the day, you paid a lot for Unix hardware, you know, and then it didn't mm -hmm. change very often, and you could run it for twenty years if you wanted. So yeah, I did want to pause. The secret of cheap hardware. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, like, uh, what drives me crazy, right, is you buy a laptop, you buy the exact same vendor version or whatever, and you'll get two different ones, and they'll have different hardware in them. Uh, yeah. One that has like Linux support, a Tesla. and one that doesn't, for example. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, all right, so one quick uh, pause here. Uh, just I've been skimming the chat, but Chris, was there are there any questions in the chat we should answer? Uh, there were questions about when exactly the the pulling of the Docker shim was going to happen. I'm looking so at the version number now. And... I pulled it out. Uh, it's 1.22 in okay. late 2021. Makes yeah. sense. Um, so yeah, so I pulled it out. Uh, like I said, with the show notes, I'll put my references in the in the further reading or whatever, because so, I I'm not sure which article I got that from. Um, but I I uh, you know I did you pull that there, note huh? out to myself uh, so that I would have that handy. Um, yeah. And this is probably a good time to then dig into some of the other ones. Like go like like for example like this before you get worried about the date think about whether you actually need it or not whether you'll actually notice it or not like mm -hmm. if all you're worried about is container images like we have a bunch of docker images they're saved in the registry will we, we be able to use those does that have to change no like that doesn't have to change at all that's easy right like like cryo container d any other runtime you know engine th this is probably a decent time to rant about the words matter and we decided to name the interface in Kubernetes container runtime interface, even though run C, the thing that gets called by Docker is actually the runtime and Docker is basically a container engine. And so is Podman, so is Cryo, so is container D, but we still call it runtime. And so people are confused all the time. Um, but, but, but the runtime is the same between all of these. So like when you fire up a container with container D, Cryo, Podman, Docker, doesn't matter, build a, uh, you know, a bunch of other things. Um, it's the exact same container in Linux. Like I used to do this demo where I would have Podman and actually I think I had Cryo and Podman and Docker side by side and I'd fire up three different containers. I'd use CRICTL to talk directly to, to uh, Cryo and I would fire up a container locally and um, I would be like, hey, like now tell me which one was started by what demon, you know, like, like look at them. And, I'd, and they'd be like, oh, look at the SE Linux. I'm like, the SE Linux is the same. Like the yeah, SVERT code that we wrote you know, that's basically SVERT. It's called SVERT, a technology that basically dynamically generates a Kuber, you know, or a, or a SE Linux label. That's the same in KVM. It's the same in, it's the same in Podman. It's the same in Docker. It's the same in everything because Run C uses it. So like Run C calls the same thing. Um, and we so could, like you literally I mean, can't tell these containers apart when they're running. We could have we could have named our database SQL, right, and our web server uh, Internet Information Server, um, you know, if we wanted to, you know, play with the big boys. Um, so yeah, actually, that so I do have a little demo of that. I don't. Do we want to talk about that? Um, because I, I thought it was interesting, uh, particularly seeing as I don't do multi-machine Vagrant files very often, and I always like to uh, show off Vagrant as well. Um, so I'll just share this dealio Boop. um 
All right, you should see VS Code. Is that yeah. what y'all are seeing? Okay, cool. Um, okay. So what I did was, obviously, I have a lot of experience with Podman, so that is first in my list here. Um, but so uh, we have, um, you know, basically, I just, you know, I set up libvirt so that it has four CPUs and some RAM and whatever. But basically, I just install Podman, Scopio, and Builda. Um, I probably actually only needed Podman for this demo, but, you know, it's kind of my default install. Um, and so I also love Vagrant. Uh, I just... Uh, Hard to believe it's 10 years old. <laughs> it's Is it only 10 years old? I actually think it's... 10 or 12, something that. like that. Yeah. yeah. I thought it was older, too. Um, yeah, and like I, I love the origin story of like basically making it because I had this problem all the time because I was a web developer for a long time is that like, um, you know, how do I make it on a Mac so that I can uh, have multiple running web servers without having to know the ins and outs of virtualization and, you know, and like routing and all that other stuff. And it just works. And it's, it's really, really good. Um, I still have a theory that Vagrant could have prevented Docker from ever existing if they yeah. would have had a image repository that was yeah. similar to Docker Hub. Right? Well, so I don't everything. If you remember our original container development kit, which uh, I had a big hand in, um, was based on Vagrant. And it did, so Vagrant relatively early on actually adopted Docker as a runtime. So you could, so the way Vagrant works is it basically wraps up a virtual machine and makes it kind of easier to manipulate, right? Um, but it can also wrap up that virtual machine in say AWS or in wherever. Um, and, um, but it can also wrap up a Docker container. Um, and I'm not sure how much that's used anymore, um, but the way the original container development kit that we shipped worked was it would go get a rel box and then put containers on it and then let you manipulate those containers via Vagrant. Um, I was pretty proud of it, uh, as well as automatic registration, which I think was my most proud moment. Um, <laughs> I remember using this too, but my brain is fuzzy on on what year that was. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I'm with you. Uh, I told you it was probably before 2010. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because maybe we're old. Um, no, no, the CDK wasn't that long ago. It was only yeah. like five or six years ago. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, all right, so. The next thing I did was, okay, so if you've ever been on the show before or you've used Rel, you used Podman at all, you like, this is really straightforward, right? Um, and this statement, unlike in Docker, is highly unnecessary. I'm just doing it to make my uh, VM a little bit smaller, a little bit cleaner, Not no particular requirement there. The next one I did was I went and actually looked oops, at the like Docker install docs. Um, and so I went to Docker's website. Now here is where the confusion really starts to begin. There are at least three different versions of Docker, um, which is the, the one I'm talking about here, which is the freely available and, you know, I think fully open source, um, you know, so I don't mean freely like as in not open source, um, but freely available uh, engine that will run a Docker container. Um, and if you notice, when I install it, I actually install container, excuse me, I install container D um, and Docker. And so as far as I can tell, what it's doing is that UX that we know and love is actually talking to container D, which from earlier in this discussion, you know that what Kubernetes is talking about doing is exactly this. Uh, so, you know, so basically it's kind of already working the way uh, Kubernetes is planning to work or, you know, is kind of in the midst of moving towards, right? Yeah, um, for the most part, I don't think the Docker CI, the Docker daemon doesn't use CRI to talk to container D, I don't think, but. The, yeah, that's kind of where I wonder how, where the, where that API kind of connection is. I think it's but, an internal API. Yeah. Okay. So long story short, um, there's, so when we say Docker, we could mean this one, but there is also their enterprise version, which is what they, you know, sell support on, which I don't, I didn't have a copy of handy. So I assume it's the same as this or very, very similar. Um, so, you know, your mileage may vary. It might be worth a follow-up just to test it out. But I imagine anything that works in the, uh, uh, kind of freely available version will work in the fully supported version. Um. So the part that gets confusing is that we have one more version of 
Docker, which is there was a name change of the upstream project called to something called Moby. Oh, and this is not um, the New York City rapper or not rapper, you know, techno, uh, techno yeah. artist, um, you know, who has a shaved head um, and looks weirdly like Jean-Luc Picard. Um, but <laughs> I've never is, never thought of it like that, but yes, <laughs> right. So, uh, so uh, you know, but so basically, what I wanted to do here is, um, you know, this is not an official uh, installation, um, but it's you know, it's pretty close. It was on Fedora Magazine, which is you know published widely. If it was horribly wrong, it would have had you know a wall of comments and would have gotten you know corrected. Um, but this is how you get Moby on Fedora. Um, and this particular article was written for 32, so I adapted it a little bit for 33. Um, one of the big things to note is that it uses, what are we on, V2 of C groups now, um, and this uses V1 of C groups, uh, yeah. which is fine, um, you know, but it, it really will need to upgrade soon if it hasn't already. Uh, I didn't find any documentation that it had. Um, and the so, blocker has been historically run C, um, run C won't like it wasn't quite ready. I don't know where that's at. Like as of today, it's close. I know that much because Giuseppe Scrivano, one of our guys, has oh. been working on that a lot to get run C to work with C groups V2. Actually, okay. it looks like um, somebody in the comments did say it does work with C group V2. I wasn't clear if it did or not. So that's yeah. why. OK, it looks like it doesn't work yeah. in Fedora. Um, I thought he was really close upstream or yes, it sounds like he got it done. Yeah, I wasn't okay. tracking it super close. So, so that this basically this line here should become unnecessary soonish, right? Um, but you know, it kind of installs the way you normally do. Uh, I was a little confused about why it installed Docker Compose by default, um, but probably I'm because not. Docker Compose is super useful. Uh, so, you know, um, and we've actually we've covered that in another episode as well. Um, you know, you know, trying uh, like trying to replicate some of the Docker Compose and, experience and, with Podman. And this is a time where I'm going to do shameless plug for Podman. In Podman 3.0, we'll be able to support Docker Compose. Really? Yeah. Sweet. It will, you'll be able to use the Docker that. Compose binary. It will talk to Podman and it will literally deploy containers. Because yes. I've been doing it with YAML and uh, I'm all set to switch to uh, Signal. Um, so yeah, like uh, you know, doing it in YAML. Um, while uh, what I uh, kind of make the point of is, it's forward compatible if you want to move to something like Kubernetes, which is super nice, rather than Docker Compose, which is kind of like a dead end. But Docker Compose has a great user experience, much like Docker itself. Uh, that's really hard to. Pass and there's up. a bunch of code written in it. So like one of the one of the migration paths we're hoping to support is you can use the Docker Compose, get some of your Compose files basically running in podman and then do the kube generate you know generate kube and then mm -hmm. generate the kubernetes yaml and so then like we see a path there where you'll be able to basically import your compose files get it running make sure it's exactly how you want and then save it off as like a kubernetes yaml and then then you're in kubernetes yaml world and it feels like you're free because you can go between podman and kubernetes all you want there's a question in chat uh when is podman 3 going to be available uh, <laughs> tomorrow may ish may ish <laughs> may ish may er early May. I mean, actually, so, you'll probably end up being able to test it on Fedora and send to a stream probably January, probably later this month, I would mm -hmm. guess, like wow. may, maybe early February. <laughs> as, yeah. uh, as somebody else brings up in the chat, yes, the only the only dates we can provide ever are date-ish. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but uh, yes, uh, which is a very weird form of speed dating that you don't want to participate in. Um, <laughs> So yeah, um, uh, kind of going back to uh, the the uh, code here, uh, code um, you know basically the install script. Um, so I think I shared the whole screen, so you should be able to see this. But what I wanted to kind of make the point of is like, um, and you know I will I will cheat with the um, you know hey I. I did this in advance so that it would actually work. Um, but I promise I didn't make any changes besides what is checked into the repo. Uh, it is actually, if you want to look at the repo, um, it's uh, there under the branch called uh, 2021-01-06. Uh, it's just, I don't, I don't like to actually push it to master until I have the show notes and everything in there. Um, but it is pushed. So if you want to see this Vagrant file or the Docker file I'm about to show you, uh, it is there. Um, 
the the only thing that uh maybe i'll go one of these days and write a patch for uh um what does, tla, what does t-l-u-h mean oh, come on level up hour the level up. Oh, t- all right i was like tla <laughs> is this some new tool that i don't know exactly <laughs> that's really um, hard to say in my mind yes yes so i would really like vagrant ssh uh to instead of just yelling at you for not choosing which server you want why can't it just prompt you for which server you want i don't there understand why i have to type it in again um because i'm lazy uh so theoretically that's running and that's cool so <coughs> what what we can do here is um you know i kind of like oh boy uh, like I said, I did a little bit of this in advance, um, but I just made a super simple Docker file where, you know, I get Fedora and then I install, a, you know, a couple things and then I do my clean just to make it a smaller uh, container image um, and I give it a command. Um, you know, it, this is worthwhile to explore more complex Docker files. Um, and, you know, I just wasn't sure the value versus time kind of trade off for it. So. Um, you know, feel free to play around with this yourself. Uh, that's part of why I published the Vagrant file. You know, feel free to go grab it and, you know, use it any way you like. Um, but so one thing I'll point out, you know, we have to do it with sudo. Um, you know, one of the tricks on at least most of the Linux is, I don't know about doing it much on Windows or Mac, you know, because I mostly use Linux. Um, one of the tricks is actually to add your user to the Docker group which will let you do it without sudo, but will be aware that you are running it as root. You just um, happen to have, it, basically it's a no password sudo um, kind of scenario. So you can just run the command rather than having to uh, actually uh, choose it. So we just do Docker build um, and I will create a new build just to uh, show you it working. Um, and hey, caching is a lovely thing. So it was already built. So it basically just runs and installs. Um, and then we can say um, Docker run IT. And this actually, yeah, IT. Um, I don't want to remove it. So I want to make sure that this is going to stick around to finish the demo. Um, and that should just work. Um, and it does look at that. So now I can ping. And one of the cautions that I read in one of the articles um, was that the networking may be slightly different. So that is some place where your mileage may vary. Um, and let me see if I can find my what about, note. What about the networking, Langdon? Yeah, so I was just looking for it. Um, I can feel, I can smell smoke. Yeah, I know, I know. I'm just, <laughs> I'm trying to read where, where did I get that from? I may be crazy. Um, That's entirely possible. It is possible. But I thought I saw somewhere uh, to, oh, oh, so that's what it was. Uh, private networking within a Docker, oh. within containers, may be slightly different. So it's worth experimenting with, um, but it shouldn't be. Um, unless you're doing something kind of truly crazy. This is, and so. you actually bring up something I didn't bring up in the article. This is another place where you might run into sharp edges going from Docker to cryo or container D. Right. right. The way networking is done. When you end up doing it with CNI, it could end up being slightly different. But this is another one of those ones that I do not understand how people end up down this rat hole. Like, <laughs> this is one that I'd never have understood. Like, I've never changed the networking ever because you're running web apps. Like, why do you ever need? to even muck with it but somehow from data and talking to a lot of people people always go down the rabbit hole of well i gotta change ip i gotta do this i'm like why do you have to do that like why does that matter but it matters to a lot of people so like i'll warn that's another warning area yeah so um yeah i'm often one of those problem children so uh, why you know, why do you change the ip i i i like i like pain I like to hurt myself. Yes. Um. I've literally <laughs> never changed the default networking in Docker ever in six years. I've never had a reason to. I've never been like, oh, you know what? I really wish this would DHCP on my regular network with my VMs. Like, no, I don't care. Let it nat. I could care less. Like, yeah. I literally yeah. don't <laughs> care. Like, let it nat. Let it. Yeah. Nat. Yeah. I, let it I, nat. I was trying to think about it for, and part of, <laughs> it, it was nat. actually really funny when my, when I was going to set up this demo, um, 
this is the first time in a long time that I went to go put together a demo that was in VMs versus inside a container. Um, but, you know, as you say that, I actually, I don't know that I've mucked with the networking like like you're talking about like kind of you know rejiggering how the dhcp works or any of that stuff i mean yeah, i've definitely done bizarre. private people networks do it, and stuff like, a lot but, of people like if you look the number one question we get in podman is hey i'm doing this weird networking thing in docker and podman's not a drop-in replacement and they like get all mad and i'm like i i have no idea what you're doing with your networking <laughs> like it's impossible for me yeah. to understand that <laughs> that's that's hilarious <clears throat> all right so Coolio. Uh, I like to use the cool kid terms from, you know, 20 years ago as much as possible mm. uh, on, oops, uh, on the show. 30 now, by the way. Yeah, at least 30 years um, ago. Yeah. yeah. So, all right. So we just uh, created this new container. So, um, you know, I don't think uh, this gets enough play, but, um, you know, I still think that uh, this feature is one of the coolest ones that there is. Um, I'm actually not going to name it that. I'm going to make it something that I will remember. Um, and so what we do is I'm just committing it. So basically what I said was take this container, shove it in this tarball so that I can now transport it in the ugliest possible way uh, I can, not using a registry, any of that stuff, just moving the tarball around. Because I thought that would be like the truest test in a sense. Like I know nothing has changed that container image because I've literally just tarred it off, right? Um, so now we are going to, and one of the nice things about um, you know using Vagrant for this stuff is just you can uh, do something like this, um, and you always know where your home is um that's weird this totally worked now i can't now i can't type i don't know what happens to me this is the it's place just for the typos show. and demos not working so yeah 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 um <laughs> so tell us right. what you're doing here langdon are you copying this over to i was going to take it from the moby one which is where i created it to the docker one if I can type, which we know I have massive fail. Um, Copy paste and is your friend. Exactly. All right. And so now we have that tarball. Um, and, you know, obviously I was, well, that doesn't look good. 72K, huh? Hmm. Or seventy two bytes. Small bytes. Yeah, that yeah, seems, that's a, that's that a, really, really like, small. That's the minimum tarball size you can have, I think. <laughs> Is it? <laughs> I think so, yeah. Yeah, that's just like the metadata for tar. Yeah. <laughs> Did I do something wrong on my commit? Oops. Um, I lost my uh, command, of course. No, oh, that looks right, doesn't it? That looks right to me. Oh, no, it's not commit. Duh. Export. Now, I always uh, get export and commit confused as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. That looks a lot more realistic. And when you're piping it into tar, you've basically got an error output or something. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Um, which, you know, thanks, tar. Um, <laughs> all right. So now we're going to jump to the Docker machine. Uh, and so, you know, as you saw in the Vagrant file, this is just set up with uh, the Docker CE per, you know, Docker's installation instructions. Um, and we are going to try our SCP, which is probably going to take a little bit longer. Yep, that looks better. And then now we conveniently can still just run Docker import um, and then bloop. And then now the only difference is we may not have the name. Oh, which actually I can fix that because there's a command. Um, I discovered after the fact. I, I think this must have been added in like recent years because I swear you couldn't do this before. Um, oh, name it on the way in. Yeah. Docker images, uh, and there it is. Um, and so now we can. Um, it's funny. It's my probably important to point out that that was a copy of the running container that is now an image. Yeah. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So it might have been more interesting if I'd modified it to show the change. Um, but we can now run IT and just type 
Uh. And I did something wrong. Bash. Yeah, it should have gotten the command, though, shouldn't it? Um, hmm. When you import. Yeah, I wonder if it lost my. my I think CMD. it might lose. I think if you would have. I think if you would have saved the image and imported the. And yeah, if I exported the image worked. instead of the container, it. I think it would have worked. Yeah. Probably would have worked. Yeah. Um, I wonder if that's what I did in my test. Um, because I, I swear that was working. But, uh, you know, we can prove that networking still seems to work. Um, yay. Um, that was longer than 23 milliseconds, I just want to point out, in real life. Yeah. I don't know if that was your screen lagging. It but... was. It, there seems to be a delay on the initial. Like, one. look at that. It that's be... way longer than 22.6 milliseconds. Like, that's definitely a lie. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. We'll have to take that up with the uh, Fedora people. If, if, Scott, I think you should file a bug uh, that the ping response time is a lie <laughs> and, and see how well that goes. Um, all right. So, you know, networking works, you know, it's kind of like, I don't know what else to kind of show, you know, the fact that it runs at all is basically, you know, we're pretty, we're in pretty good shape. Um, yeah. Thank you for the won't fix um, in the comments. Um, <laughs> And, you know, I get that a lot from my, uh, from basically all of my uh, bugs. Um, all right. And then, you know, kind of just for the last example, we just have, okay, Podman. Um, and it's funny, my muscle memory has definitely shifted to Podman versus uh, from. Um, Mine has too. Yes. Yeah. It's really yeah. amusing. Uh, so let's just cheat and copy and paste. Uh, okay, and then we can say sudo, uh, nope, podman import. Um, and what I love is that it's exactly the same command with, you know, whatever, six different letters, uh, except I don't need to do sudo because I can do this as me now. And then I can run. And yeah, that's weird. I totally thought that would carry. Um, and then, you know, everything just works exactly the same way. Um, it even it even fails in exactly the same way by not picking <laughs> up the command across the yeah. across the different versions. Um, yeah, we should point out, yeah, that and that's true because it's probably um because it's important that that OCI meta or Docker slash OCI metadata. And it probably is the same. It probably is missing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and actually, we could. Oh, wow, that was impressively wrong. And by default, like some, something that people might not realize if they're not deep in this world, like when you did it the way you did it, because you went from Docker to everything else, those are actually Docker specific image formats. It's like 99.8% right. the same as OCI, but it is technically slightly different. Right. Yes. Um, and, and Podman didn't even hiccup, just imported and worked. Right. But, uh, it even says imported from Tarball. I don't think I've seen that before. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, you can kind of go and inspect it. I think you can kind of see, you know, um, I wonder, it's probably this Docker IO part here that indicates that it's a Docker image. Um, but this would be an interview with Dan Walsh to know for sure. Yeah, um, exactly. So, but as I say, I don't, I don't remember. There's a couple few little tiny pieces of metadata that are different, like in weird ways. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so that was my little demo. Like, kind of the point of the demo is that there's not much to it. Um, but, uh, you know, there's that uh, that I wanted to share with y'all. Um, and I noticed it is 56 after mm -hmm. the hour, uh, at least in uh, Eastern. Um, for Narendev, is that uh, 36? probably uh or anybody else who's on a uh, a non-clean hour. hour break um let me uh yeah, share so the sweet sweet internet point time everybody sweet, scott sweet this internet. is the uh this is the this best is the part, of the, part of the show yeah so what do i do with, can i use these points can i make money off this oh yeah oh, oh yeah definitely I mean, we've seen people just like them every, on ebay you can make <laughs> as much money on these as everyone else can <laughs> so uh we've had a little bit of movement um you know we had a we had a, yeah. a a new person show up and uh and see a couple of episodes over the break um i will say i have a few 
uh, kind of administrative points that I give out. So like initial show and like uh, some filing, some issues that are not represented here. Um, so I just pulled it before uh, that data was added. So these are a little shy. So maybe there will be some uh, jitter uh, come next episode. Um, and, uh, you know, but, you know, Netherlands Hackham, who I actually haven't seen in the chat today. Uh, no, he's here. Is he? Okay. Yeah. But is uh, is leading. And then Narendev with a relatively close second. And then Noah Friction, uh, slightly behind that. Um, have we seen Noah today? I'm not sure. Um, uh, no. I, if they are watching, I haven't seen them comment. And then Joe Fuzz, who uh, you know, holding on at eighteen hundred points. And then JP Dade, you gotta go, you gotta go fill out those forms. We know you're here a lot. Um, so, uh, but if you want to collect uh, sweet, sweet internet points, which have the value of being listed on this list of people who have collected sweet, sweet internet points, um, uh, you can go and at the bottom of the page there, you can just go to that form and enter that code or the other link there is basically a deep link uh, to the to the same thing. Um, and can you grab that, Chris, and put it in the chat? Or uh, I can. Can you grab it? Hang yes, on, if I can it find this stupid window. Right, exactly. Um, so, and then one of the things that I've been trying to do recently, but uh, don't always recall to do, uh, let me just throw this in the chat first. Um, and so to uh, someone's question in the chat, what are sweet, sweet internet points? Uh, they, are, they are unfortunately not like the $35,000 Bitcoin. Um, yeah. They uh, are uh, a way that we uh, like to encourage participation. So basically, um, there's a bunch of different things you can do uh, to collect points. You can watch the episode and fill out the form like this. You can uh, file a PR, which is actually how Netherlands Hackham has pulled ahead. Um, and you can, uh, you know, there's a bunch of other activities. So if you go to the episodes repo, which I just realized, I don't think we ever put a link to that in the chat. Um, mm, let me just uh, grab it. If you go to the rep episodes repo on the activities doc, there's a whole list of things that you can do to collect uh, sweet, sweet internet points. Um, and... One of the things I was saying I, I've been doing lately is to try to collect some people who ha are new to the show and say, hey, you know, I hope you came back um, and we would love you to continue watching the show. Please, you know, bring up your points. Um, and uh, thanks so much for, for coming to the show. Um, so are we, do we want to kind of wrap it up here? Do we have any other kind of points to make? Are there any other questions in the chat that we haven't answered? Um, we are just about the top of the hour, um, but I don't think we have a, a hard, hard stop today. No, we don't. Um, so we can. Sadly, I do have another up. meeting. Yeah. So like. Yeah, yeah, but you don't want to go. You want to hang out here go. with us. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks so much for your time, Scott. Um, and uh, let's see. I think we have some unrelated HPE isn't. No, I'm, I'm talking. Uh, yeah, okay. JP Dade right. and I have been talking about HPE for a couple of weeks now. So, gotcha. To download patch files to his home and then upload them to work, and that is just an un an, an unfortunate use of time. I will yes, call it probably <laughs> faster sometimes to FedEx a USB key. Yeah, um, <laughs> exactly. So, uh, never yeah. underestimate the bandwidth of a of a station wagon barreling down the highway with a thousand <laughs> tapes in the back. Right, right, right. Well, that's, that's one of the things, like, I really, like, if I if I ran a data center, I just want to buy AWS, whatever it is, Glacier or whatever, where they roll yeah. up with the tractor trailer full of hard drives. Like, so it, it's funny. Someone actually was like, was, like, complaining that AWS took an armed guard with the trailer on, and, like, that's how they protect your data. That's part of it. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, it ain't money, it's data, which arguably right. sometimes is worth more. Um, but uh, yeah, so thanks everybody for coming. Uh, we, I think, are planning having an episode next week um, yes. where we're going to talk about our, because we've been talking about NextCloud as kind of like our de facto example, and we are going to uh, take a look at applying service mesh features to next cloud 
right. um, which is like which next level. Awesome. Yeah, cloud native uh, kind of crazy. Um, if you are unfamiliar with what a service mesh is, please uh, come to the show. Um, but it's you know we kind of in short, it provides a bunch of kind of administrative features that are hard to uh, do cross-cutting into an application without massive application change, uh, but with zero code. Uh, so it's it's pretty cool. Uh, so definitely come, come to the show next week. Um, and Chris, what else do we have going on today or coming up this week? Uh, coming up here at uh, 11 a.m. Eastern is the OpenShift Administrator Office Hour with uh, Andrew Sullivan and I. I forget what he has planned today as his discussion point. I think he was still choosing between one or the other yesterday. But we'll be there to answer your questions, including you know any problems with HPE equipment. So yeah, uh, <laughs> let us know uh, at 11 a.m. Eastern. That is now 1600 UTC. Sweet. Awesome. Uh, like internet points. Um, all right. Bye, everybody. Bye. Right, see you guys. Thank you for joining. Thank you, Scott. Really appreciate yeah, you joining. Thank you for yeah, thanks so much, Scott. Cool. Take care. <laughs>